Father, we ask you to bless this class to our memories. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So much of the evangelism that we, ha are, we think about when we talk about here in Greater Grace has to do with personal evangelism. And that's what's missing in, the, in so many thousands of churches across the world. That people people would never think of evangelizing anybody. But what we have not been um, delving into a lot as a ministry is campaigning. And, and don't, don't think that it is beyond your capacity to campaign. Now I know some of you women are sitting there saying, I'll never be an evangelist standing up with a microphone on a stage. That's probably true. You probably ought not to. But there will be men around you who lack the capacity to pull off something of that magnitude because they're not detail-oriented. You might provide for them The administrative gift they do not have. There's a lot of pastors without their wives would amount probably to nothing. It's their wives that keep them going. They would forget all their appointments. They would be late for everything. They probably wouldn't pay the bills. They would probably end up in a poor house if it wasn't for their wives. I'm not saying all pastors. I'm saying some pastors. <laughs> Now I want to talk about, we have here in public evangelism, number five, campaigning. This is the end of the world, by the way. You're not gonna, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be a grand, if you're sitting here and you're 20 something years old, you're never gonna be a grandmother or a grandfather unless you get cracking immediately and break every law. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw it out there. These are the end times. We talked about, at our last class, we talked about the fact that the, in Genesis chapter six, and I know some of you, this blew your mind because you've never heard about it, but that if you do study Genesis chapter six, that there were angels who Satan convinced uh, that they ought to possess the body of men and then have sex with women on earth and have children. And because of the fascination and jealousy of angels who are jealous, they were jealous of man. I don't blame them. I don't blame them. You know, some women are a beatific vision. If you know the word beautiful, I just, I just used one of those phrases that probably no one would know. If you're watching on film, I have no clue what a beatific vision is. I will explain. That if we take the word beautiful, right, and you have a beatific vision, we have a beautiful vision. We could never say that about a man. Men are just dogs. There's no such thing as a beatific vision of a man unless some woman's talking about Sean Connery or Elvis. <laughs> but that's beauty is in the eye of the beholder or something. Typically, we don't think of men, the men are not beautiful. Typically. If you know a beautiful man, just keep him to yourself. <laughs> I don't want to shake his hand. And I don't want to sit next to him in church. But for some women, women can be a beatific vision. Let's face it, women have the geometry. They've got that amazing, you have these amazing geometric ratios that women dominate. And I, I can't explain it any further, I don't wanna get in trouble. Spring is a long way off. In the spring I'll explain it in another message someplace. But the angels who were jealous of men, meaning males, 
They were jealous of males because males get to have girlfriends who turn into wives. Then they have this romantic life. I don't have to explain. And these angels were conned by Satan into possessing the bodies of men, having sex with women, and their sons were hunters of men. And the reason that Satan did this was so that angelic genetics would be in men and they would corrupt the promise of Christ by marrying angels into Christ's lineage. This is why the flood came. Noah's flood. During Noah's flood, all these warrior type of men drowned and died. And their souls were sent to Tartarus, which is a temporary hell for angels. It's one of the three hells. We study them in the New Testament and we read about the fact that they left their first estate. Meaning that they left the home that God gave them and they left the certain form that God left them. They had a certain abode where they lived. Imagine the Heartbreak Hotel floating around someplace filled with demons. We have them over, we have them over our city here in Baltimore. We have a Heartbreak Hotel which has, you know, like um, heavy metal music um, that these demons are responsible for. Also the clothes that goes with that kind of music. Notice that music, dress, and mentality go together, right? Then we have a big giant, big giant heartbreak hotel filled with demons that are rap demons. Certain way to dress, certain drugs you take, and so on. Then we have one for the motorcyclists. Their drug of choice is meth. Their music is the doors from 40 years ago, easy on the demons, they don't have to find new music. And um, so on. Those demons who lost their first estate had power. That power worked within the realm of what God gave them as, as a domain before they fell. They left that estate. Now, there were plenty of demons who didn't leave their estate and have power in a certain part of the world, and that part of the world is their estate. Now, here comes the disciples of God. The disciples of God come into that geography with power from God from that exact geography. And when you argue, when people argue with me that there is no such thing as the geographical will of God, then why was Christ born in Bethlehem? And why was he raised from the dead in another place? And why are there prophecies concerning all these things that name specific places at specific times? Because God has a will, and it's very, very specific. So when we go into an area, we have authority from God to be there, and everywhere our soul of our foot, everywhere we put our foot, becomes holy, holy ground because we're motivated by an eternal vibration which changes the way things are going to happen in that space. Point in case, the apostles. These are the, man, the men who turned the world upside down. That before they, came, before they come into a place, at the top of the pecking order are demons. And beneath the demons is lesser demons. And be, beneath the lesser demons are um, the, the governor of the area. His uh, councilman, the town councilman or the, the, uh, the city councilman or the nas his national cabinet. And then there are uh, important merchants, landowners, and, and it goes way, way, way down to the merchants, then the people that work for the merchants, and then the people who steal from the merchants. Until the disciples show up. Then they take that order and they spin that whole order onto its head. And they 
Everything in that town is under their feet, not because they're mighty men, but because God has ordained them to be there. I can tell you, believe me. That brings us to campaigning. That I'm not saying that our ministry as a ministry has thought small. I'm just saying that we have thought big on different occasions at different times in the world. And it's amazing what can happen. There is fishing with a hook and a line, and then there's fishing with nets. Sometimes you need to think big. If God has set you in a place and sent you there, sometimes it's right to think big. That we ought to rent auditoriums and soccer fields or try to have big venues and dare to do it. If you get the idea, that doesn't mean you have to do the speaking when you're there. That doesn't mean you have to lead the way. You have to be, we've already discussed this a little bit. Now, as you look at campaigning, I wanna talk about something that may precede campaigning called the urban clock. Are you ready to, to write a definition for it? The urban clock, meaning the city clock. And urban is U-R-B-A-N, the urban clock. Here's the definition. And you're supposed to write this down and know this or you'll never do it. The urban clock is a schedule system. The urban clock is a schedule system that maximizes outreach opportunities. That maximizes outreach opportunities in a specific compacted time frame in a specific compacted time frame. And this is the most basic kind of campaigning. And what it means is a team of believers goes to a certain place for let's say a weekend or th three days or four days or one week. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna go around the clock with outreach to see how much they can get done in a couple of days or three days or four days or even a week. It could even be a month, but you were gonna to be toast when you're through. It's great for a hot, we used to have summer hot, we still do have summer harvest and winter harvest programs. The urban clock is awesome for those. So you're going into a certain place and you have a team I don't want to use military words, but it's almost like a military operation. Everyone on the team has a specific job they're going to do in the urban clock. So there needs to be some um, maybe targeting involved. Uh, how many of you have been involved with the farmer's outreach? The farmer's outreach is kind of a little bit, it almost touches on this. That you're gonna have a booth at a certain place, at a certain time. They just did it up in um, Indianapolis and 149 people came to Christ in 24 hours with a single booth. It's pretty good, it's pretty good hunting, I would say. The difference is, if you, have, if you like to fish with a hook and a line, in other words, on an individual basis, great. But sometimes, if you want to plant a church, if you want to maximize your opportunity in this place, you want to have a plan. Now, we talked about the fact that we, to, in order to have, um, how did we put it last class? We were talking about having a, a um, a visionary, a team, and an agenda, sorry. <laughs> Remember that? We have, we have a visionary. It doesn't have to be the person who's gonna do the teaching if there's gonna be a certain amount of teaching or a certain amount, so many altar calls in that place. 
I remember when I first received Christ, I went to watch Dr. Stevens at a giant Baptist church in Boston. I had just got saved. I was attending a Baptist church not far from Boston. It was only like a 20 minute ride to go here at Dr. Stevens. I knew nothing about him. But when I went into that hall, I could just sense the electricity. I'd never been around a huge corporate faith field. Our little Baptist church, sometimes it was anointing there, sometimes it was not. When there was anointing there, we really got pumped up. We didn't even know enough to identify it as an anointing. We just said, oh, what a great day today was. That's as far as we went. When I walked in that hall and Dr. Stevens was on the stage, he was just getting ready to come up, and you, there were so many people there that knew him from radio, you just sensed an electricity in the air. I didn't know anything about dunamis, the power of the physical power of God. I didn't know anything about exclusia, the proclamative power of God. I didn't know anything about kratos, the witness from the spirit of the giant, how giant the kingdom is and how real it is. I didn't know any of that. All I knew was I, it was an electric environment I was in. And when Dr. Stevens got up there to preach, he, he was talking about, you know, about the things of the kingdom. I don't even remember the message. And he said, in a little while, we're going to go out in the streets and we're going to win souls for Jesus Christ. We're inviting everyone to stay after my message. We're going to teach you a little about soul winning. And we're all going to go out for Jesus Christ into the Boston Common, into, and he was talking in this, in this way. I'm just thinking, wow, man, I want to do that. I want to be part of that. So we went out. I was a brand new believer. A month before that, I was, in, I was kind of working for Satan part time. And uh, now I'm going to work for Jesus part time. So we came out of there and they said, uh, the leaders will be standing in it. So they had, this whole thing was called Operation Spike Nut. It was a campaign to win souls. And I liked it. I saw this van. They said, if you need gospels, go to that van. We looked in this van. There's probably a half a million gospels of John in this van. I, I'm ashamed to admit we had to steal some. After we were done, we said, we've worked for the Lord. We need some of those Gospels for the beach. So we broke into the van and stole it. We didn't break any glass. It was easy to open. We took them. We repented later. So you cannot judge me. But at any rate, it was just awesome. And you know what? The sense that we could do it was in the air. You know what it was? It was the anointing of God was there. These guys had planned this. They had prayed about it. This Baptist church, who had formerly not wanted to even talk to anyone, was hearing the radio show, wrestling, imagining how many believers are out there listening to the show. They opened up the church. Suddenly there was unity. That unity produced the sense of anointing. The Kratos was there. It was just unbelievable. And I left there, and I said to the guys in our church, I said, we got this, we, we, our church was on a public beach, I said, we got to pull stuff like this. we got to do stuff like this. And they said, yeah, 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 yeah. So they said, I said, let's do it right away. Let's, let's start right away. We're going to do big stuff. And I said, okay. And I was doing all these people just staring at me, going, go ahead, you know, we'll help you, whatever. So I rented, <laughs> I rented the high school auditorium in that city, not knowing anything, not knowing how to preach. Not, I, I knew I couldn't do the speaking. I rented this auditorium. I went around to um, people. There was a revival going on in Boston. Guys I knew that played rock and roll. I said, you know any Christian songs? <laughs> no, man. Who does? Oh, Bob Monfiglio, he knows some. I go to Bobby Monfiglio. I said, Bobby, how many Christian songs do you know? He goes, oh, a couple. He's a rocker, you know? Plays like Led Zeppelin and stuff like that, Rolling Stones. I said, uh, we got to get some more musicians. You got to make a band. He goes, uh, what are we going to do? I said, next week you got to play. He goes, I, we can't play in a week. I don't know any songs. I said, learn them this week. So he, he got these musicians again. None of them, none of them, they were brand new Christians. They would play rock and rollers. So they had their, they had their band going and all that. I rented um, Nicky Cruz movies. The Cross and the Switchblade. Fit where we grew up perfectly. We had posters from the company that made the film. We put them everywhere. I had a committee. A week before the event came, we had a committee meeting. I found out that no one did anything. This lady who was this like hyperactive business lady was on the committee. She just looked at me, like talked to me afterwards. I called her over. I said, you, you, we can still do this. How much of this you want? She took five or six things to do. I took five or six things to do. We kept pushing, going forward. 
That night, long story short, the place is filled with teenagers. They want to see the cross and the switchblade. Just that word switchblade got them there. <laughs> got this whole audience filled with people. No preacher. Two nights before, no one wants to speak. Every church in the city does want, they don't want anything to do with this. I had to call this ministry in the state of Maine. I was down in Boston. I said, uh, we need a preacher. Lady goes, who needs a preacher? I said, we rented an auditorium. We have Nikki Cruz movies. She said, what time should the preacher be there? It wasn't, who is this? Is this some maniac? Are you going to strangle this preacher? <laughs> no questions asked. What time does he need to be there? What is the address? Da, da, da. They sent us down this preacher. We had the Nikki Cruz movies on. Out comes this rock band playing Christian music. It was real Christian music, but they, in between things, their fills were a little wild. It sounded like Eric Clapton was up there, you know, but it was okay. And um, this preacher from um, Bible Speaks at the time gave the altar call. You could have heard a cricket. He wasn't thrown at all. He said, okay, let's bow our heads again. He changed the whole altar call around, made it more for Catholics. None of the kids who came got saved. But there was probably 50 or 60 parents in the back there to pick their kids up and take them home. 25 parents got saved. The famous, the infamous Healy family came into the church through this outreach. We go back to our Baptist church with all these index cards of people who, that we don't know who these 25 adults who got saved. Our own church did not want them. No church in town wanted them. Not long after that, the annual, the annual church report came out. And in it, there was a feature about our outreach. And our outreach was called a demonic attack from Satan. I'm a brand new member of this outfit. Someone's, look what they called you. I said, me? Where? I'm reading, reading along all happy. <laughs> Demonic attack from Satan. I said, is that me? Yeah, that's you. I'm thinking, oh, gee, now what happened? Wasn't well received. But to the glory of God, 25 people got saved. We got this awesome preacher came to that church. He wanted to win souls. We started, like, going crazy. The elders of the church told him to attack greater grace. He said, I will not do that. They fired him. He wouldn't eat, he dehydrated and died of a heart attack. That was my introduction to church warfare. It had nothing to do with the fact that anyone was Baptist. It had to do with our elders who were nuts. They were crazy people. They didn't know God. Yet the church was filled with people that knew God. It was sad. And the fact that we could have success like that showed me something. That if God leads you and you dare to obey God, great things can happen. I came to this church through a blown Bible study. This Bible study was horrible. It was all screwed up. The music was horrible. The people who came from greater grace to put on the study were awesome people. But a lot of the people they brought were kind of nuts. Because during a revival, many crazy people are getting saved. When there's a big revival, usually the crazy people get saved first. So sometimes around a revival, you get a lot of nutty people hanging around. But this blown Bible study propelled eight people into Bible college. The group that gathered around this bad Bible study had a lot of people. There was like 40, 50 people crowded into uh, this living room. And there were a lot of interested, uh, interested parties. The Bible study was basically a failure. It only lasted about maybe eight or nine weeks, a couple, two, three months. But a lot of people came out of it saying, I'm going for it. I like this, this thing, this teaching, this um, unconditional love, this finished work thing. We didn't know anything about it. If someone said, explain this to it, we couldn't explain it. But God was moving. Now, in the urban clock, there has to be, uh, someone needs a vision for this. Now, the cool thing about a vision when God gives you a vision, if God gives you a vision, is that a vision has its own life, and it has to do with the mind of Christ. That God is getting ready to do something. He's using you to do it. 
So when we come into an area and, and God is leading you to do something, you just don't want to go in blindly and do something, but you want to understand the area. Now, uh, like for instance, what is the demographic in this area you're going into? What people are in this part of this city or in this nation or in this country? What is the demographic? You say, well, what's, what's that have to do with anything? Uh, what, uh, literature and music, for one. Literature and music. What type of track will be the most effective track? What kind of poster should you have if you're going to have posters? And by the way, posters are awesome. I know they're all old world. You know how if you go into an antique shop, they have a wall full of posters, like for the circus? Do you know what I mean? Does everyone here know what posters are? Uh, in the 60s and 70s, you could never find your way to a rock concert without a poster. I had these Christian buddies from South Africa. They used to print up these like old fashioned, like circus looking posters for a Christian event that was going to happen for street people in some park with Christian music and evangelism and all that. And a guy used to walk down the street with uh, posters in his hand and there would be a guy with a, you know what a staple hammer, uh, guys know what this is, it's a staple hammer. Just something you whack and it puts out staples. If you're ever mad at me, please don't hit me with a staple hammer. So this guy would walk with the posters, and the guy walking just in front of him is taking these posters and going whack, whack, like that, and putting them on a thing. And then the guy behind him has this, like, not wallpaper glue, but this stuff, this sticky stuff, and he just throws it over this poster that makes it adhere to this telephone pole or a construction fence, which is awesome for posters. And sometimes the circus would be in town, and these guys, there'd be, like, 100 circus posters going down this construction wall. You know what a construction wall is? So things don't fall on people and hurt people. And here's the circus went through the business of putting up 100 posters. And my buddies from New Zealand, they would, <laughs> they would come, for the, they were working in New Zealand, they were from South Africa. They would come with their posters and the guy would be walking backwards and the guy's going boom, boom, boom like this. The whole circus, every one of their posters for a quarter of a mile is covered with this, this Jesus outreach. Now, of course, the circus posters, they have a permit to do that. The Christians, of course, do not. And chook, 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 chook with the paste and all that. <laughs> and it has to be relevant to the demographic. You should have tracks, too. How many languages are being sp spoken in that particular geography? Right? Let's say, um, let's say you're in India. You, you can have, you can use English, right? But there's also Hindi. In terms of literature and music, how is that going to work for you? Do you need translators? You need, someone on the team has got to decide they're going to take care of counseling. You're, you're expecting if you have an altar call, people are going to get up and want to receive Jesus Christ. So can you see how this, this person who is a, vis a visionary is putting forth this vision and then the team is coming along and taking this vision and gonna, they're going to make it real. They're the foot soldiers. And then um, there's going to be an agenda. You have this plan, a timetable. It's possible that it would be an urban clock that you're going to pull into this town where you don't have a team currently and no outreach, you're going to do this thing, then a team's going to go back there by train once a week, and it's going to follow all these name cards up and try to create a church out of nothing. Now, I would rather do that than go into that town, cold turkey, and just start one person at a time. Wouldn't it be more comforting? Let's say you're going to be a missionary. You're starting out in a foreign city or even in, here in a domestic city in the United States or Canada. Would you rather start with 70 name cards or no name cards? I'd rather have 70 name cards, right? You may not, nothing may happen, but you might get some free lunch, have a new friend and get a job. But <laughs> 
I'd like to have it. Now, that means, let's say you have the idea, but you have no clue how it's going to happen. That's why you're on a team. That's the strength of team. You gather all these people together who have the mind of Christ. You get some pretty smart people there. You have a couple of people who are very good with a computer who can email stuff and send files to print shops and you can pick up, pick up your stuff all done. I mean, I think it's, it's gotten a lot easier to do this than when I first proposed this or tried it myself. I think it's a lot easier now to pull this off. Now, this urban clock means that everything is planned out. Let's say you're going to pull off a campaign in a city. Let's say you go to a country, and here's this city that's this awesome city, and you want to do this. Okay, what's, well, now I'm going, to, I'm going to see what you think. What do you think would be the first thing that you should check out? Okay, you raise your hand if you have an idea. Let's have some ideas. What's the first thing you should check out? Just think like this. You're invading the city for Jesus. Okay, I'll give you one. What is the public transport like? There's a good one. What is the public transport like? You're, you're not going to get people from the ruling class and from the stock exchange in that country coming to this, probably. Okay, what, what is the public transport like? And um, is, there, is, there a small, is there a small outdoor stadium, or is there an auditorium that you can get for almost nothing? Are there believers in that city that will partner up with you that are incapable of doing this themselves? When I went to Australia, we went to this Baptist church. It was the same Baptist church when George Mueller was in Sydney, Australia. He used to preach from their pulpit. This is an old place. It was called Burton Street Baptist Tabernacle. People from that church have come to our Bible college. When we met them, we heard they were soul winners. All these elderly people were going out and winning souls. I mean, these people were really elderly. Very elderly. I mean, they had canes and walkers. They were out winning souls. We show up, three young preachers from Greater Grace in Lenox, Massachusetts. We were soul winning. And these bikers said, you blokes are evangelizing. We said, yes, we are. They turned around. They had these jackets that said on the top, ambassadors. They looked like hell's angels, but they were believers. They had, there's, there's some blokes up the hill like you. I think I got their number in me, in me wallet. So a guy takes out his wallet, gives his phone number. We call up this church. We go up to see them. We all come dressed, you know. We all brought a sport coat with a tie and a white shirt and our, and our gym bags. This is, this is Australia. You're not going to bring a major wardrobe halfway around the world. We show up and we knock on the door. The head, the head pastor was the editor of one of the oldest Christian magazines in the world, and he wrote their prophetic articles, Greek scholar. It's past, uh, pastor um, Stuart... Um, Oh, man, I should be shot up if I forget his name. Not Pastor Hazen. Pastor... Oh, I'll remember before the class is up. But either rate, we're invited into his office, and it is, it's all mahogany paneling, like you see in the English movies, with his sets of books everywhere, and this huge desk, hardwood desk, and this elderly gentleman sitting there. He said, are you lads the Americans? We said, yes. He said, come, sit. So we sat down with him, we prayed. And he said, what are you doing here? And we said, we're from a ministry called The Bible Speaks in the United States. And he said, and what are you here for? We're here to, we're here to look at Australia as a potential mission field for us. He says, what do you people specialize at? I said, evangelism. He's looking at me. Then the elders, he said, get the elders to his assistant. And all these elderly elders, elderly elders come in. <laughs> and, and here's this guy who doesn't know us from a hole in the wall, this elderly uh, Baptist preacher. 
He said, these lads have been sent by God to help us. He said, who's the leader here? I said, I guess I am, sir. He says, you'll be in my pulpit tonight. That's in an hour. <laughs> I get up. This pulpit, you had to climb a staircase, and the church was down here. You were way up in the air, like you're on the bow of a ship looking down at the audience. And George Mueller had spoken in this pulpit. I was like way up here, and the people were all like this. And I just let her rip with grace. This guy was like blown away. I gave him a copy of the cross, the ultimate frame of reference. Next time he saw me, he was blown away. He says, I need a case of these. Can I get a case of these? He bought a case with his own money and gave everyone in his church that booklet as a gift. This guy was blown away. Before we left that night, he gave us the keys to the tabernacle. This place was called the tabernacle. It was the most ornate Baptist church in that part of the world. It was the oldest Baptist church in Australia. The first people that were baptized from this church were stoned by the inmates. They didn't die. They were hurt seriously, but they did not die. And he gave us the keys. He said, if you lads want to use the church for anything, please do it. And we helped those people the three, three or four years around Australia. And we tried different things, coffee houses and exploits, all kinds of evangelism. So when you get a vision to do something, don't think it's silly because you got the idea. It could be that God is trying to speak through you. You don't have to be Billy Graham to do it. You might need a Billy Graham to pull it off, but you'll have to find him later. So finding out things like the demographic footprint there, what is it like? What, what type of people live in this part of the city near this auditorium or small soccer stadium? It could be a soccer stadium for children and only hold a couple of thousand people. You might say, well, that's too big. You don't know that. How do you know that until you try? So first, what is the demographic? What is the public transportation like? You want to pick a, an auditorium or a small soccer field that is not far from, from the um, public transport, right? You don't want to have this be, to be a remote place that only people that have automobiles can go to, and so on and so forth. Does, any, does, anyone, else, does anyone want to ask a question or make a suggestion about this? Yes. What about the, the freedom that the country that you are, freedom? Oh, the freedom. To, to speak with people, what the law says, and how to behave wisely. Right. In other words, is it legal, or do you need a permit to do it? And I mean, it would be, there is places that is illegal to talk with people and that's right. about that. So to find out that, it can be important. Because we will still do it. I, I have been in places like that, like Madrid in the state. Yeah. We can talk with people, but but I did. We did it wisely. I mean, secretly. But in order to do that, you have to know what is going on first. The freedom of what religion or what they believe. What you're not hearing, if you're sitting way up back, is is that. Um, questions and statements about the fact that in some countries it's illegal. It's illegal to solicit for religious reasons. You could go to some countries where it's against the law because of the religion to do something like the urban clock. In that case, the urban, cl the urban clock could be a, a, just a scheduling system that you use in a country where the gospel is illegal and you can't do anything great in public, but you might be able to do it privately if the team is big enough especially. But this is more for a place where it is legal, where you can obtain permits and you can get away with this. If it's in certain countries, communist countries, Muslim countries, some Buddhist countries, and some places in India, it's not, just, it's not safe to do it. You have to really do your homework so you don't get the whole team beat up or hospitalized. 
So we're thinking more on the long the lines of evangelism than we're thinking missions right now, although this has very serious uh, application for missions. Here's, here's, a, here's an example of um, an urban clock that someone developed and was utilized. At 6 to 7.30, people were already up on the team. The early rise in the team went to the train station to witness the blue collar workers going to work. They were giving out specific tracks for people who worked in factories and places like that really early in the morning because that city had many factories. Other team members went to places where agricultural workers were getting their breakfast and coffee. They were already up before the other ones. In other words, on the edge of that city there were farms. And the farms have a lot of, because the machinery wasn't big in that country, they were, wit they were witnessing to guys that were standing in line to get a cup of coffee and a pastry. Because in a lot of places in the world, that's all you're going to have for breakfast. You're going to have a, a hot drink and some kind of piece of bread or something sweet, you know, a bun of some kind. And they went out to hang out with the farm workers who were standing in line to get their cup of tea or coffee in a bun. So this team, this team was spread out all over the place. And this probably more, this particular urban clock is probably more geared for a country like we're talking. And um, then at 7.30 to 9, two or three workers were in the business dis district dressed up and giving out a different type of track. And then others were trying to have a morning Bible study uh, as guests of a church. At 9 to 10.30, this is a very serious schedule for a pretty good sized team. There are nursing home visitation at 9 to 10.30 after breakfast. Some of the people went to these giant um, kind of social medicine places for the elderly. And then there were some people who didn't want to do that. They were just on the street having a cu cup of coffee in one hand and tracks in the other hand. And, <laughs> and then um, there was a Bible club visitation. They hooked up with a church. And they were going to see mothers whose children were going uh, to that church and hearing, um, like, uh, I guess, Sunday school type of lessons, but during the week, after school Bible. Then at 2 o'clock, you see how we're going around the clock here? The team is regrouping at 2 o'clock and having, like, a little wrap, and they're following up and they're having questions. This is from, um, I think... Uh, 1989. <laughs> then other people are starting to hit like uh, train stations, ferry stations, and places like that. A few of the team members are there witnessing to people that are traveling to and from work. Other ones are going to Lutheran churches and trying to get involved with the Bible study programs to see what's going on and give altar calls. You know, any country that's formerly a British colony, and in Northern Europe too, you find this, that Lutherans and also former British colony, you can, there are Bible lessons happening in public schools. Uh, how many people in this room are from Finland or Sweden, one of those? Did, did you have Bible during school? Morning devotional. Morning devotional. And the church in Finland got involved with that, didn't they? They had people all, I know, because I was there, and I went with um, the... Pastor Kohanen, who uh, was there in Pastor Shallow's place, all over the place. In Australia, you could, you could, if you would put on a suit and a tie and went in any public school of any size and said, I'd like to volunteer to be one of the Bible teachers, they would ask you what qualified you. If you seemed at all rational and not a lunatic, you could get that job. You could be teaching kids the next day, 30 or 40 at a time, two or three classes a day. A lot of those kids need to receive Jesus Christ. So we're still on our clock here. Now we're up to 6.30 or 7 at, in the e early evening. And um, now the agricultural workers are done and they're trying to use, be in a country church out near the farms. They want to have a Bible study with guys and evangelize guys who aren't saved. And they're inviting them to have coffee with them and meet people from whatever country. 7 o'clock to 10, you're out soul winning in the theater district. The whole team is there together going crazy. 
There are, they're getting tired now and getting really silly and goofy, which is fun. It's funny to get goofy. I remember in Australia, we used to go, we used to go soul winning once a week at this famous place in the red light district that there was this giant fountain that was made to look like a snowflake, a big giant snowflake. And all, every, every single person that went to Australia as a tourist wanted to stand in front of this famous fountain and get their picture taken with the sparkling fountain behind them. We used to go there once a week at night in the red light district and hang around that fountain and witness to people all night, almost all tourists. But we had lists of places they could call around the world where they could hook up with our church. Okay, so now we come, uh, we have, there's a, there's a rap, there was a wrap at 10 o'clock and then at 11, if you dare, um, they're hanging around cafes and stuff near the theater district and just having coffee late at night and the team can only do a couple of days of this because the team's going to flop. That was a, that's an actual developed world. Uh, that's an urban clock right there. So you just went from before breakfast all the way up to after midnight. So this is a tired team. So maybe they can do this two or th three days at the most. Then they go back and they have data. Now, years ago, I used to, when I first taught this about the urban clock, we had to have index cards. Now you have smartphones that have more memories than the, more memory than the computers that I remember that were around when I was in Bible college. Those little, those computers that we used to have, now the phones that everyone's carrying around with them in their purse or their pocket have more memory than those computers that we originally played with. So... The urban clock, of course, you're witnessing to as many people and you're trying to pray with as many people as you possibly can. But the important thing is to keep information. Some of these people are going to give you their phone number. That's pretty important. Someone's phone number. They get, they've given you their phone number. Now, the great thing about today is now everyone can sit around with their phones and go through their whole day. It was harder when it was index cards, you know. Because, you know, pastors are notorious for writing things on nap, you know, like a McDonald's napkin. I know men do that all the time. Men, you know about this. You write something really important down on a, on a, a napkin from a sub joint or a hamburger joint or a slip of paper. And then you go, I'm going to call that number you start. Oh, gee. Oh, no, no. You start looking, digging your, tearing everything in your car apart. And I used to tell the girls on the team, I said, girls, when men write things down, take it away from them as soon as you can. I used to tell the girls, get, <laughs> get that index card away from that pastor. And if the pastor doesn't have a secretary on the field or wherever he's traveling, someone needs to buddy up with the pastor and say, I want, to help, I want to help you keep a record of what's going on. And um, now we have smartphones. My phone's not a smartphone. I don't have a smartphone yet. It's smarter than a dumb phone, but it's not a smartphone. Smarter phones are smarter than my not smartphone. So you need to, we need to record all of this. And now we have these little, what are those little things that look like a plastic finger? A thumb drive. Stuff like thumb drives. Can you imagine a whole weekend of evangelism? Every single thing that happened, everyone's got their phones out and someone's just putting it in a phone and you've got a thumb drive with all that precious information on it. Then you're going to work over those notes. How many people were blue collar workers? Uh, from the eastern side of the public transport? How many white-collar people from the business district came? How many people below the age of 24 came and who are over the age of 14? How many kids 14 or under left their numbers and you're working this stuff over? Now, you could have came as a team just to blow the minds of, like, pick a city out, Paris. Bunch of people 
go there for summer harvest and you pull, you go to a city that may be not like Montpelier, Montpelier, how you say it? Is that my saying? Am I saying it correctly, Montpelier? Is that right? It's good enough. You go over to that city with some Paris people, you pull an urban clock and you hand them the thumb drive. You realize how much has happened? Can you imagine if the Apostle Paul had a thumb drive? <laughs> imagine Peter holding up the thumb drive and saying, I got 5,000 names. <laughs> <laughs> That's like having like f four mega churches just in, his, just in the palm of his hand in his pocket. Then you start working over the, interpreting the information that you have on the thumb drive. Because you want to visit these people. Some of them you have their address. Some of them you get their email uh, address. And you start shooting them out emails. Right? So, the urban clock um, is actually part of campaigning. And we're going to talk about campaigning in general, but I just wanted you to see the urban clock because um, this ministry is very good at it. Our harvest programs actually are urban clocks. It's just a bunch of them strapped together. And um, some of you people who don't feel that you'll be teachers in that environment, you're, you're probably right. But you're in very important team members. You have the mind of Christ. God can speak to your heart. Whether it is the part of getting the vision or the people that come around the visionary person, hear the vision, and then God enables you then to help create this agenda that the team will execute. So, so what is an urban clock? Is a schedule system that maximizes outreach opportunities in a specific, compacted time frame. Very valuable tool, especially for those of you who are going to be involved with church planning or building teams in other nations. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, so many of our brothers and our sisters in far-flung places, whether nationally, domestically, or in foreign soil, Lord, need our help. And sometimes we go there and we just bring a body. Sometimes, though, we can come with a vision. We pray that you would enable us, that you would quicken us, that you would stir us up. And we just thank you for this opportunity to draw near to the throne of grace and to realize all these different things. And we pray that you bless us now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.